Uh, good evening, viewers, and welcome to another session of Mazungumzo. This is your host, uh, Dr. Gilbert Kisharu Githere. Uh, this time we are coming to you, I'm coming to your homes with a program uh, about Hegel and the subject of others. We have been covering this uh, for a bit of time, and today is just a continuation. We're trying to kind of, you know, from the beginning, uh, go, you know, chapter by chapter, seeing how Hegel defined how human beings acquire consciousness. Because consciousness is um, actually the totality of knowledge that human beings acquire since they are born until they are completely grown up in their 90s, the kind of knowledge they acquire. This is how Hegel handles it. He tries to see how we acquire consciousness. To me, I call it the acquisition of knowledge. And what I'm trying to show in this program is that all human beings are endowed with that ability. And another thing that is so important at this point to think about, and I'm going to bring it up right now, is that memory is such an important thing in acquisition of knowledge. A book by Fora, David Fora, uh, moonwalking with Einstein. It's a book about memory and its importance on the acquisition of knowledge. Fora follows, you know, like progenies of chess, how they are able to play chess and remember all the movements. It's all a matter of memory. And he actually gives memory more clout than even intelligence. And that is the most important thing, that memory in the oral tradition of the Africans is so important. And that shows oral traditions archived their material through human beings by just storage of the knowledge storage of what they know, and then they will produce from one generation to the other one. And then the consciousness, acquisition of a consciousness, is an inherent thing, is a natural ability of human beings. So actually, the most important thing, as I said before, is that you've got to have language in order for you to acquire consciousness. The basic tool and the most important and the only one more actually is language. And that's where you find that <clears throat> in covering consciousness, you have things like conceptual consciousness, cons cons conceptual, how you concept things. You, are, you are percept things, you percept things, you conceptualize things in the environment, the objects. So conceptualization of, of consciousness is just a step in acquiring knowledge. Because if you've read Immanuel Kant, he shows the steps of acquiring a knowledge or knowing the object develops from a perception, perception, concept, Intuition is kind of on a separate realm of in its own a notion, having a notion about something before you do it. That's also a mind thing. It's also a step in knowledge, notion, experience. And all these things are parceled together by understanding force. And I showed you that a previous subject we dealt with that uh, material. And now we are continuing. And you can see in the writing on the board, or I can call it in the screen that you're looking with me, you can see perception plus perception equal concept plus concept, because this is a development of knowledge. And the perception is just a kind of a, a little primitive acquisition of knowledge is in the sense certainty. The mind has not acquired so much finesse in the acquisition of knowledge. There is, there is just element of ego 
and understanding of object is at its primal level, very, very, very primary. And then, as these things happen, we must remember, even if it is a child developing, this discussion going on between individuals in the society, it's all a societal uh, thing. So as we discuss conscious formation of consciousness, is that you consider a child has gone to kindergarten and is learning things with interacting with other children, interacting with the instructors and day caretakers, those people who take care of the children, the socialization. That's why then our knowledge is acquired, consciousness. Don't separate it from these daily activities. Very, very common. Then acquisition of knowledge is starting to show an individual is separating self from an object. As you acquire, you know, a human being has got to separate himself from objects. The, ob the human being being actually a special object will never end also because it's like self same self same we are objects we are made of body material so if you look at us or you look at yourself from externally we are also objects but thinking objects so at the same time this this is dialectics which hegel deals with very well that at the same time, as you become conscious and separate from physical objects, you, you still have that element of matter, your matter, yourself, body, your body is composed of material, and that material is what makes a human being, the organs of the body. So you still have that object aspect in you. It's a very dialectical thing, and that every one time when we're discussing these things, you go to realize that there is that that development very dynamic and then uh, we, individual conceptualizing the mind in the self because as a child develops it starts to realize oh i have this thing up here that allows me to think allows me to analyze things and Things are determined, determined, undetermined as they appear on location. They have to be determined by, to be judged, to be analyzed, to be synthesized. And all this, if you read Immanuel Kant, the critique of purism, if you read Martin Heidegger, Being and Time, all these things are happening in human mind. Descartes, I think so I am, the mind and body thing, or never leave us. That is the thing also Hegel handles, but he doesn't go into as much to the mind as Descartes. He kind of follows the Kantian route. At this stage, the self is in a state of unconditioned universal. Because as things start, Hegel starts them with the sense certainty. You have senses, touch, sight, taste, smell, hearing, and, you know, the emotional intelligence. Inner, the consensus, conscience, the inner voice, which tells you this is right, this is wrong. So with those senses, you you actually looking at objects and you kind of this is hard this is soft ah uh, this is water this is air this is abstraction i can't see it but it exists forms and concepts forms and concepts are very very important forms and concepts because this is what forms the cosmology the cosmos in the heavens the way the bodies travel around each other and keeping their position in such an organized way 
so that the sun will do this, the moon will do this, the earth will do this, satellite, the stars and everything. There is kind of order, velocity, speed, time, matter, energy, force. They are all at work. And they are all different. They are, they are different aspects of things. And as they are different and they ramped, separate, they are so synchronized in their formulas and in their behavior in that they form a very organized system of the cosmos or the production of electricity from negative, positive protons and electrons. These things exist. <clears throat> Excuse me, and humans discover them, learn about them, abstract about them. The development or the acquisition of self consciousness is a dialectical activity which involves reconciliation of many differences. There is a cancellation of stances that consciousness takes in these journeys. There's so much to be comprehended, to be understood, and to be brought into out, to be cancelled, to be asunder, to be accepted, to be negated. That is dialectics of uh, the life of Hegel and his thoughts in phenomenology or spirit of phenomenology of the mind. It's all a cancelling out of activities and acceptance for the formation of life to, ha to happen and knowledge to be acquired. Things have got to be uh, uh, denied to exist, some allowed to exist, some diffuse inside, some get out and start looking at one another, stare at one another, challenge one another's ego. Is it like a life of being? It's like a dance of life. Form and content. I said in our notes here, you see form and content. I discussed it a little bit. Like electricity has positive, negative. And it's out there, different, positive, negative. But they exist. When lightning happens in outer space, for example, when it's red in season, and it's standard, you see lightning. That is electricity that has been produced by nature. So the positive, negative proton and electrons have collided and they produce electricity. And that's how Anderson might be so, Edison, that's how might be he formulated and thought about in electricity when he saw lightning. Because these things happen naturally in nature and human beings are, are observing them. And form and content dissolve the interdependence of the self-consciousness. And something for something else, for, for is a stance or position that reveals consciousness holds a difference within itself. And in the other program, you remember, I discussed about uh, force. Because most of life, force is like energy. Force is like gravity. And most of the laws of the universe, they actually use force for balancing themselves out in the outer space and forming that order of the cosmos. And even holding of hydrogen and oxygen together. It's a gravity formula. de separation, and bringing together using a force. Differences agreeing and coming together. Hydrogen joins with oxygen through different valences and weights, but they form water. The formation of salt. Formation of electricity, energy, mc squared. So you see all these things. It's because 
and then we understand. Understanding is so important because these forces, we can only conceptualize them and start to use them in, uh, in, in life through understanding. And that's the acquisition of knowledge. As we understand and abstract the, uh, the abstraction we do, especially just in geometry, that a triangle with, with equal sides has equal angles. 60 degrees one, 60 degrees another one, 60 degrees another. It's just an abstraction of how things form in the outer space. You're looking at the moon, you're looking at the sun, and the earth is here, they form a triangle. You can calculate the distance, you can calculate the separation, like where the moon is and where the sun is, because you can use abstraction of the mind, understanding. And understanding has allowed the universal to separate from the particular sensual state. Inner truth has been, has made this separation possible. So you can see understanding also helps us. Absolute universal, because universal is, if you say there are universal laws, that means the world itself as it operates, independent of individuals, has these laws, the plants have got to grow, the sun has got to come up, there is air in the space that we occupy, there is gravity. These are universal laws. Whether man likes it or not, they are always with us. They exist independent of us. So absolute universal is always the object of consciousness. And this comes through understanding. The individual is in a state of deciphering its relationship with objects or objectivity. It is constantly in that kind of situation. True world equal world of appearance. Most of the formulas that can be used to define motion with these variables in play, e.g. time, space, speed, velocity, mass, energy, positive, negative, and many more, always are in a state of differences, difference, but yet able to work together to solve human problems, e.g. how long a journey from A to B would take with the above variables at play. So you will see the abstraction of humans is actually how mathematics came about. Frege, Frege, the philosopher Frege, the German guy, is the one who brought up the aspect of actually using very, very precise formulas to solve questions that human beings abstract, let's say, distance. And you can see Einstein, he calculated energy equal mc squared, and he was able to use that formula to know how energy, how energy is got or can be conceptualized. So you can see this, this, these things are happening. Some, without the human being being uh, concerned about, they're taking place around him. There's light. But what makes up light? He has at one time through his mind and understanding and knowledge to decipher what forms light. How fast does light travel from one point to the other? And you can see that... Uh, the world of consciousness, in a world of consciousness, there is a vanishing of some situation, vanishing of some situation and appearance of other situations. Beyond, as the mind comprehends, comprehends what is beyond, 
as it explores its states of consciousness, self-consciousness. The understanding allows it to introduce reason as a tool in getting to reality of things. So you can see, for self-consciousness to work effectively, the aspect of reason is introduced into the discourse. The human beings reason out. If something looks reasonable by the Western concept, because this we are conceptualizing things or doing, uh, analyzing things through a Western mind. A Confucius or Chinese philosophers would at least would at times conceptualize things or define things differently. This is a Western concept of Hegel. So reason for you to get into rea to, to real to reality, you got to use reason. It's like a wand, a magic thing that humans are given by the philosophers that have been there. Reason becomes a thing which helps you to solve things which, which even at times look impossible. Then there is a word, then there's truth, there's reality. These things now start to pop in. As humans acquire consciousness, there is no way they're not going to throw in words like reason, truth, experience, thinking. And then there is a syllogism. Syllogism is also very much at play in, in reasoning out. Oh, a dog has four legs. A dog is an animal. So, for a thing to be an animal, using syllogism, you can just say it has to have four legs. It walks on four legs. And that is, the, those are uh, formulas, a predicates that human beings, individuals, and thinkers, and using the mind, start to be introduced into the discourse so that you can analyze and decipher objects, your tools, as Ludwig Wittgenstein in a, a Tractatus Logica Philosophicus, the using tracing things through philosophy, logical things through philosophy. He said there's a language game. And words in his big and beginning discussions, he had actually used words are like like tools. A range. You use it for certain uh, doing some certain things. Understanding looks at inside the inner world using appearance. The inner world that has not come in externally, it is being abstracted internally. The inner world things is all appearance. It's all appearance. And that's why things that you abstract in your mind until, for example, they become an architectural thing that you can look at. In most cases, formulas are in a inner world. And that's why as you bring them out from the inner world and they start to be appearances and they become objects of reality, then the sciences have to come in. The human being has to use his or her knowledge to make them real in the outside world. And in this area, consciousness has acquired experience and uses it to decipher or understand the world around it. For the inner world is kind of, to Hegel, is empty. Because if you look in the universe and you see lightning, 
unless the conditions are there for lightning to take place. It's raining, it's certain conditions of the weather are right, then you have a thunderstorm, then you have lightning. Otherwise, there's nothingness in the darkness you're looking at. Naked universal, things which cannot be known, infinity, infinite, but they are infinite, absolute universal. Not much of this inner world is known. It remains a void, a, a void realm. These areas are kind of said because you see, there are some things irrespective of what consciousness might want, self-consciousness, even consciousness at its pure level. There are things it cannot comprehend until it acquired enough knowledge. You've got to have a scientist. You have to have somebody like Fora write a book like uh, uh, Moonwalking with Einstein for you to understand memory. You've got to understand energy when you get a bright person like Albert Einstein and he comes with this formula and he solves about energy that we use daily. He gives us this the way it happens. Otherwise, these things remain remains as a mystery. We just we abstract about we abstract about them. We think about them. But unless you have enough knowledge, some of them will just remain. <clears throat> in a world of, of void. And this area of beyond consciousness that I'm discussing, it is like a room, dark room, and you're standing in it. You don't know whether they are valuable, gold or anything, unless there is light, you will not know what is in the room. So there is nothingness if there is, not, there is no light. And then if you walk in and it is blinding light, then you are literally almost like a blind person. You cannot see something in an extremely lit room. Is a room void. It has nothing. It's nothingness. Being a nothingness. I think that was what I was thinking about. I remain to be corrected. But I think that is what he was kind of looking at. Oh, it's like a blind person standing. This is the way all abstract things like space and time, velocity, gravity, magnitude, mass, and all these things, before they become useful to man and you know how they work. There's a, it's a world of void. It's a world of nothingness. And sometimes that's how the world looks before we acquire knowledge. Who would have known some years ago you can send a robot to Mars, take us nice pictures and beam them back to us. We are almost going to know if there is life in Mars. So before we had all this facilities uh, that are allowing us the internet, the digital world, to kind of communicate with mass, send a, a drone, is gonna fly around mass. And on a daily basis or weekly basis, send us beautiful picture of mass, or might be see a person walking around there, who knows? Or a creature of sort. So we are kind of in a, that situation where this subject actually becomes even more clear. To individuals, the inner world, the world of sense and certainty, of caution, is also referred as the super sensible world, the world of appearances, where dialectics or contradictions of positive negative situations are in constant play, cancelling one another, this behavior leaves us with a law of force as a dominant thing in the inner world. 
Because you see, if you look at the cosmos, that's, that's what we have. We have law of forces. You reach a certain level, there is no gravity. You come into a certain zone, you are grabbed by gravity and it takes you. It pulls you down to earth at a speed you can never believe. The inner universal, as Hegel discusses it, it has time, space, speed, velocity, mass, energy, it has positivity, negativity, and many more other uh, features or characteristics or entities. And they are always in a state of differences. Now, these things I'm going through is we are trying to see otherness because you can see that there is a, there is differences exist within the human life the human surroundings the whole life every day is dialectical life is dialectical Life is dialectical. Negative and positive are always cancelling one another. Always cancelling, agreeing with another. And don't, 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 conf don't get confused because you see, as they have differences, they are deremptive, separated. But they also have the, a, a very strong uh, force of working together. And they are, for that reason, because of those characteristics of being able to be put together, hydrogen and oxygen, we can have water, negative and positive, we can have electricity, mass, circumference, and can, uh, can give us energy, velocity, a distance, speed, time, and space. All these things, because of them, that's why we have gravity. They are able to work together in certain given proportions that they create a force like gravity. And as I said, you see, these things I'm passing are a little bit faster. I have talked about them. Uh, I'm just kind of, because some of them, I, I repeat them. Now, it is very important at this point for me to say that irrespective of what you talk about Hegel, the indigenous people vis-a-vis -vis Hegel, who Hegel said they have never made a will, that was kind of a, a wrong uh, terminology to use on indigenous people. Because most of these things I'm discussing, it does not need for a German or a British to come to Kenya for people to conceptualize lightning can give light. It gives light once you see lightning in outer space or in the sky. It brightens the darkness. And a human being has the mind to conceptualize that there is some force which have come together and they have produced lightning. How can we harness lightning to get electricity? That's a human problem which can be solved anywhere with time. So what I'm showing is that most of these things are inherent things in nature. They have not been put in outer space by any human force. They are just universal laws. And every human being enjoys them. That's why everywhere the plants use water to grow. You can't go to Kenya and you find people are using different things to drink or grow crops. It's water. It's a universal law. So most of the things that people have thought is the magic of the Western civilization. No. <clears throat> It's an endowment to all human beings. 
they have used force just to claim them. Otherwise, it's an inherent thing to human beings. They are left out there, you're given the mind, body, ability to think, ability to acquire knowledge, and with time, humans decipher different things. They acquire different things to better their lives. The only thing they need is language. And you can see, well, all what Hego is discussing is not what the Germans put in the cosmos. No, these are all things endowed by the Almighty to human beings, if you have to be spiritual. There are, it's a kingdom of laws. And those laws are universal and they make things work. It rains for, for the plants to grow and for living things to flourish. There's clean air for, hum, for humans and all living things to, to protect the clean air and flourish to explore the universe to any level. That's why you find if human beings agree and they work together, there is so much that they, they have been given out there. It's my thinking that every family can have a planet to itself. If the sciences become expand and flourish, that's a possibility. You don't have even to, to quarrel about China Sea. You, have, you don't have to quarrel about small, small pieces of land. The only thing is to work together, improve knowledge, improve the language, and the resources are limitless. I remain to be corrected, but I think when I look at the universe and how big it is, we, we don't have to quarrel because of China Sea. And then you see Hegel has unconditioned words like that, unconditioned. The self-consciousness at a certain level of sense of certainty and the inner world and the void is indeterminate, is unconditioned. It doesn't know really what is what out there. Indeterminate. So these are words you got to get used to when you're dealing with Hegel indeterminate, unconditioned, asunder, cancellation, negation, dialectics, synthetic, implicit, Im explicit. Because those are all, if you look at them, one negates the other one. And everything in Hegel's world is in a state of contradiction and dialectics. Positive, there is a positive and negative to everything in life. Even right now, what I'm saying, there's a negative to it. There's a contradiction in what I'm saying. It can never be perfect. So you can see where the world of appearance, the world of appearances has many variables at play, e.g., the world of energy as perceived by Einstein's mind. See there. So that's what I said there before. That Einstein had to be there and help us to understand energy and how we can utilize it as human beings.
Otherwise, it remains a void, a nothingness out there. But in nothingness, there is so much out there. In a state of differences. But yet, irrespectively that they are derailed, separate, they are so much in unison or synchronized to work together if the correct proportions are there to produce something you can never even believe existed out there. And consciousness is, consciousness is the beginning at a sense certainty level. Consciousness is the real thing. But consciousness is the dominant. But consciousness also divides itself into other smaller consciousness. And ours as human beings, it becomes self-consciousness. And self-consciousness just develops when we start to acquire knowledge. when we actually use discussions we form we formulate sentences and those sentences make sense and they help us to arrive at understanding whatever we are doing and that's why the predicates snow is white is white is a predicate words the tools we use we use the same words but defining different things. If you are doing biology, we use the same, same words but using the format and the structure of biology. From sentences which actually help us to understand chlorophyll in, in plants, in chemistry, is chemical. We use the same, same words, but put differently using the predicates like uh, hydrogen. When you combine it with two parts of oxygen, you have your drinking water. But the way you define it, you're using the same language game, same words. That's why words are so important because they help us to actually manipulate our world, discuss our world. Whether we go into science, chemistry, physics, biology, politics, geography, economics, we use those same tools, the words. And this word the rent I use here is, the rent to Hego is so magical. The word the rem is what actually is holding the world together. Separation, differences. But yet those differences are so joined up together and are held up together. Uh, I, let's say, for example, the world. The gravity holds all the formulas that I'm talking about together. Until we meet next time, I might have confused you a little bit. You go in and read. Gonna get, you can understand. It is, these things need a bit of reading and analysis and thinking. I'm just kind of going over them. You try to understand Hegel because if you don't understand Western philosophers, you will never know why there is racism. Because you think Hegel invented a phenomenology of spirit. No, no, no. He just helps us, helped us to see clear, clearer from a Western concept uh, uh, perspective how we arrive at saying there is an obsolete being up there because there are some things we cannot decipher, we cannot abstract. They remain a mystery. Like when we, we pass away, where do we go? What becomes of us? That is at the center of all Hegel's writing. Death. Because we cannot be, we cannot be able to recreate life. Might be human beings will become so knowledgeable, I 
remain to be corrected to be able to discover the secret of life. Because even knowledge, as a human being acquires it, a kid acquires it, it starts to realize that it is not mortal. It is not immortal. It will come to an end. That is the, the highest realization of a human being. Once you grow up and you have acquired knowledge, you understand, understand you are you're not infinite. There will come a day you have got to address yourself to the end of being in this world. Until we meet again, this is your host and friend, uh, Dr. Gilbert Gisharu Gizdere saying cha-chao for now.